Dr. John Herbert. So, uh, uh, John began his independent career at the Ohio State University in 2006 and has the rank of professor since 2014. He's active in many areas of quantum chemistry, including particularly computational spectroscopy, the description of non-covalent interaction, and order and algorithm based on fragmentation. His research group is a major contributor to the QCAM electronic structure code. The title of today will be Poisson Equation Boundary Conditions for Quantum Chemistry. Okay, I see. Yeah, th thanks for that. So it looks like you can see this. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we see everything. Okay. Um, so thanks very much for the, for the introduction. As I was saying earlier, this is my only my second CCAM workshop and the first one was only last week. Um, so sort of a long title, but the, the important part here is that what I'm going to describe is, is putting arbitrary continuum boundary conditions um, around a quantum chemistry calculation um, based, on, based on Poisson's equation. And so I'll spend maybe a third of my talk motivating why we want to do that. Um, and, and then talk some about the, the theory and this generalized Poisson equation solver that we have for, for quantum chemistry, and then spend the last part of my talk um, on, on an application teaching you, I hope, a little bit about the physical chemistry of ions at the air-water interface and, and what, how these methods can be brought to bear on, on photoelectron spectroscopy at the, at the air-water interface. Okay, so um, those of you that know me from this electrostatics context, probably know me in the context of polarizable continuum models that I've worked on for you know, 10 years or so now. Um, so, so these are, are sort of the, form the foundation of the standard continuum solvation approach in, in quantum chemistry. And I'm primarily a quantum chemist rather than a molecular dynamics person. And, and so the, the polarizable continuum formalism um, is, is a really efficient way to solve um, something equivalent to Poisson's equation for isotropic, um, for, for isotropic solvation in, in, in a sufficient way because it, it recasts the, the Poisson equation as a, as a surface integral formulation. And so it requires only the, only the discretization of a, of a so-called solute cavity surface that delineates your atomistic QM region from a, from a dielectric continuum. Um, these are, are nearly exact electrostatics models. In fact, they, they can be made into exact electrostatics models if your solute is classical and there's no escaped charge and they can be formulated in, in terms of, of linear scaling computational algorithms. And I, I noticed that, that Benjamin Stamm is, um, is attending this, this talk and he and Filippo Lipparini have really defined the, the state of the art in terms of order in um, PCM algorithms with their DD Cosmo approach, which is not what these data are, but, but Filippo gave a, gave a very nice talk as part of this seminar series back in July. So I'm not going to belabor this. In fact, this is not what I'm going to talk about today. Um, because the limitation here um, is that these are models that are appropriate for isotropic solvation, i.e. for a solute in bulk liquid water. And, and I want to talk about anisotropic um, solvation environments. And so you know, why, why might we care about that? Well, because um, we care about spectroscopy, in molecular spectroscopy in heterogeneous um, solvation environments. So here's one example. Um, these were some calculations done with my collaborator, Barry Dunitz, where um, he and his collaborators have, have taken some coumarin dyes and put them into these octa acid capsules. And then this whole um, host guest system is, is in aqueous solution. Um, but effectively, the, the chromophore here, the coumarin inside, um, doesn't see the the polar um, aqueous solvation environment, it, it sees a very non-polar um, environment with an effective dielectric constant of, of maybe something like three, like epsilon equals three. Um, and 
knowing that now, um, after the fact, we, we could simply model the spectroscopy of this coumarin in a, in a continuum environment with dielectric constant equals three. Um, but, but proving that this was the case required us to model this, this environment in a, in a heterogeneous way with a, with a polar dielectric constant um, outside representing aqueous solution and, and, then, and then something different, something nonpolar. Um, inside, and so it required us to treat the continuum environment in a in an anisotropic way. And and then the application that I will talk about today is 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 um, in detail is is spectroscopy at the air water interface. And so this is going to be based on on solving a generalized version of, of Poisson's equation, um, generalized in the sense that there's an arbitrary uh, permittivity function epsilon of r that's in principle allowed to, to vary however it wants, however you want to, to model it in space. And so epsilon of R is in fact just defined pointwise on a three-dimensional grid. And, and so you know, we can model a bulk solvation environment in, in that way, like you might do with a PCM, although it's a less efficient way to go about it as compared to a PCM. But more interestingly, we can, we can model an interface. And so, how that's going to look in the applications that I'll talk about is that you have some sort of atomistic um, description of your solute and, and my atomistic solutes are going to be described with, with quantum chemistry. And, and, and my atomistic solutes are going to include some amount of explicit water molecules, typically about two solvation shells. And, and so there's an ion shown in, in gold here and then two solvation shells of, of water around it. And so that's my atomistic region described with quantum chemistry. And then the colored background um, tells you something about what this, what this permittivity function epsilon of R will look like for modeling the air-water interface. And, and this, this geometry would be some snapshot that we would pull out of an MD simulation. And now we're gonna go do some quantum chemistry calculation on the spectroscopy of this atomistic solute um, with anisotropic continuum boundary conditions. Okay. And the reason that we want to use those continuum boundary conditions is, is, is that we really need those to, um, to accelerate the convergence specifically of ionization energies. So um, vertical ionization energies as in photoelectron spectroscopy is, is what I'm interested in. Um, I suspect this audience skews more biomolecular and, but, but so in a, in a biomolecular context, um, similar remarks can be made about, about PKAs where we're adding or subtracting a proton that, um, that these are quantities that, that involve long range Coulomb effects. And, and so in a quantum chemistry calculation, it requires hundreds, you know, maybe three to 500 um, explicit solvent molecules in order to converge in ionization energy with respect to um, treatment of explicit water. And, and that's gonna become prohibitively expensive very quickly in a quantum chemistry context. Um, becomes prohibitively expensive in two ways. First of all, just, just growing the size of the QM system is expensive, but if, if you only need to do it a couple of times, you can just sort of brute force it, but, but more importantly, the more explicit solvent you have, the more you're obligated to, to sample with, with molecular dynamics. And so you're on the hook, not for one or two quantum calculations, but maybe for hundreds um, of quantum calculations. And so by enveloping the system in, in dielectric uh, boundary conditions, we can accelerate the, the convergence because the, the continuum model takes care of the long range part of the, of the solvation interaction. And so let me show you some data here for uh, vertical ionization energy of the nitrate ion in, in aqueous solution. And so what's, what's changing here along the horizontal axis is, is how much explicit solvent we're, we're keeping in this calculation. So, so we're just taking a, a ball of, of water around this ion of a certain radius or, or a certain number of water molecules. And so um, five and a half angstroms or about uh, 40 water molecules is two solvation shells. And, and you can see um, with vacuum boundary conditions, i.e. just including those explicit water molecules, this, this vertical ionization energy converges very slowly 
and, and the experimental value is here. And, and so if you sort of extrapolate this in your mind, um, it's going to be prohibitive to, to take this out to, to convergence. Um, and so instead we're, we're going to, to put continuum boundary conditions around this thing, but, but standard or what I'll call equilibrium continuum boundary conditions are not going to work. And so if we just, um, this is nitrate in, in aqueous solution. And if we just slap um, epsilon equals 78 representing water around both the initial state nitrate calculation and the final state, which is the ionized um, nitrate radical, um, you see that the, the convergence accelerates, um, but we're still not reaching the experimental number or not reaching it very quickly. And the reason for that is, is that these, these so-called equilibrium continuum boundary conditions are appropriate for, for adiabatic ionization energies where we have relaxed the, the final state geometry, but not for vertical ionization energies, which is what is measured in, in photoelectron spectroscopy. And so for vertical ionization energies, which are going to be the observables um, of interest um, for me, uh, we need a so-called non-equilibrium continuum formalism. And I'll tell you a little bit, this is still sort of the introduction. I'll tell you a little bit more detail about this later, but the basic idea um, is that the initial state of the system gets solvated with the full dielectric constant of the solvent. So um, that's epsilon naught, meaning the, the static or zero frequency dielectric constant for water. But then the, the final state, or, or technically the, the difference density between the initial and final states, gets solvated not with the static dielectric constant, but rather with the optical or infinite frequency dielectric constant, which for water is about 1.8. And, and these blue data here are are the same set of calculations with non-equilibrium continuum boundary conditions. And, and you can see that within something like two solvation shells, it converges nicely um, to the experimental value. Okay, and I'll show you more, more examples of this. This is not a fluke for, for nitrate, but that's, that's the basic idea. And this, this non-equilibrium correction, you know, the difference between solvating both states with epsilon equals 78 or, or doing it in this way, um, it's about, half an EV in, in, in this case, we've seen cases where that non-equilibrium correction approaches one electron volt in an ionization energy here that's on the order of, of nine electron volts. And so it's, it's certainly important if we want quantitative agreement with experimental photoelectron spectroscopy. Okay, so, so that's just to, to set the stage. And, and now let me tell you something about how we actually do these calculations. Um, I'm going to tell you about our, our generalized Poisson equation solver for quantum chemistry, a little bit more detail about this non-equilibrium theory, and, and then um, show you in more detail how it matters for vertical versus adiabatic um, ionization energies. So generalized Poisson's equation is shown here. And again, it's, it's generalized just in the sense that we allow this dielectric function, this permittivity function epsilon to be um, just defined point-wise on a grid. And I'll, I'll come back to, to what exactly that is um, in, in a few minutes. Um, the density here, this is the, the charge density for the atomistic solute. And so in, in my hands, that's gonna come from quantum chemistry. And, and I should just say, if, if you're coming from a, a biomolecular perspective and you pr prefer um, Poisson-Boltzmann equation, uh, you know, we can extend this, this solver in a fairly straightforward way to Poisson-Boltzmann equation, and, and we've done that um, in, in both linear and, and nonlinear forms. Um, but, um, and, and so the, the variable, so, so the, the solute charge density comes from a quantum chemistry calculation. And so the variable that we're solving for here is the electrostatic potential phi. And, and that, that total phi has a part that comes, a, a solute part that comes from the charge density. And, and then it has a polarization part that comes from, from polarizing the continuum. And so operationally, the way this algorithm works um, is, is that we take the charge density from, from quantum chemistry um, and we compute the corresponding electrostatic potential phi on um, a three-dimensional real space Cartesian grid, typically with a grid spacing of about a quarter of an angstrom. And then we use a, 
fairly standard um, eighth order finite difference solver um, to solve this equation. Um, and, and so the, the bottleneck step here is, is actually computation of the, of the QM electrostatic potential on that grid. And then actually we, um, we get the charge. So <laughs> there's a charge density that underlies this calculation. You, you compute a bunch of Gaussian integrals to get an electrostatic potential. Um, but then we don't actually represent the charge density directly on the grid. Um, so the, the basic variable from the quantum chemistry part is electrostatic potential. And then, and we found that the algorithm is much more stable if we then get the charge density from, from Poisson's equation. Um, and it, uh, otherwise we, we have sort of instabilities as you change the grid spacing, the, the integrated number of electrons um, is, is fairly sensitive. And, and this is a much more stable version of that algorithm. Um, so we've implemented this with a, with a multi-grid solver, but, but it's, it's fairly standard um, numerical machinery. So I'm, I'm not gonna discuss the details there in this 2018 paper, um, but just to show you that this, this multi-grid version where you, you move up and down between, between finer and, and coarser grids uh, converges and there's two different versions of this in, in red or in blue, but it, but it converges much, much faster than a sort of prim primitive or, or, or single grid um, conjugate gradient solver. So we can, we can solve this generalized Poisson equation. Okay, and then the last thing that we need to stipulate is the permittivity function. Um, and, and in all of the calculations that all, all of the data that I will show you, um, we define this permittivity function in terms of a, of a sharp interface as we do in polarizable continuum models. And, and so, you know, for example, with this small glycine solute shown here that we have some sort of cavity defined in terms of atom centered spheres. And then the, the permittivity function is either one um, inside of that cavity because we're doing um, explicit quantum mechanics with explicit Coulomb operators. And, and so you should have vacuum permittivity. And, and then it's the, the bulk um, solvent dielectric constant outside. Um, something we've started to experiment with is this. So you might call this a sharp dielectric interface. Um, Oliviero Andreucci um, group, uh, originally he comes from the Pisa uh, PCM tradition, but he's now at the University of North Texas, and, and he has pioneered um, what he calls a smooth or a density dependent um, interface function, where we switch uh, between vacuum permittivity and bulk solvent permittivity based on based on the density, and and, and so this is actually a, a very efficient um, or practical way to implement. Um, a, a cavity surface definition that, that's based on the actual quantum mechanical electron density of your molecule. And so responds to, to, to changes in the size of your molecule as you say, change the oxidation state of, of different atoms. And it's a really elegant approach that, that my group has, that, as I say, was, was pioneered by Oliveiro, Oliveiro um, Andreucci, but, but we started to experiment with it, but I'm not gonna show you um, those results. Um, so we're going to use this sharp dielectric interface um, based on atom-centered spheres, uh, but we're going to want to simulate air-water interface. And, and so on top of that, we're going to have, um, so, so these are going to be snapshots taken from a periodic slab MD simulation. So there's an air-water air interface with a Gibbs dividing surface to, to delineate the, um, the interface. And, and that that Gibbs dividing surface, you know, we, did, we then interpolate from epsilon equals seventy eight to epsilon equals one uh, smoothly across the Gibbs dividing surface, and then you can see the imprint here of, of something that looks like a an atom centered cavity. Okay, so so that's going to be how how we describe the the permittivity function. And and then the last part of the theory is is this non equilibrium version of the continuum formalism. And I'm not going to derive that, but I want to introduce it by way of, of analogy of something that's 
probably fairly familiar, and, and that's the Marcus theory of um, of, of reorganization energy in, in, in response to an electron transfer um, event. And, and so this is the standard um, so-called outer sphere or the long range part of the, of the Marcus reorganization energy in terms of distances between donor and acceptor spheres. And the, the important part is, is, is that what shows up here is this, this dielectric dependent prefactor that you'll notice has a, has a factor involving the, both the static um, dielectric constant, but also the optical or the infinite frequency um, dielectric constant. And, and so similarly, this, this non-equilibrium formalism is really just a generalization of, of that Marcus idea. In fact, the, you know, Marcus's first papers in the 1950s were really working out um, non-equilibrium um, dielectric continuum theory. And so, you know, this is just taking that and turning it into a, um, uh, an efficient computational paradigm. And so the idea is that fundamentally your, your dielectric function is, is frequency dependent, um, but we're going to, and, and so the, uh, the susceptibility, which is just epsilon minus one over four pi inherits that, that frequency dependence, but, but we're going to model that frequency dependent dielectric in terms of its low and its high frequency limits, the, the zero frequency static dielectric constant and the infinite frequency optical dielectric constant. And we're gonna use those two values to separate the polarization response into um, a fast part that represents the response of the polarization response of the electrons on the solvent. So even when the, the solvent nuclei are frozen, um, there's some part of the polarization response that can follow a, a fast perturbation. And that fast perturbation is going to be, say, ionizing the, the solute. And then there's a slower part that involves all of the other uh, relaxation mechanisms. And so in particular, the vibrations um, and the orientational degrees of freedom of, of the solvent. Right? And, and, and so we separate the susceptibility into fast and slow parts and then the, the polarization um, response can can similarly be separated into into fast and slow parts. Okay, and then um, I won't derive the math here, but but there's a couple of terms in the non-equilibrium uh, correction to the energetics, and so just representing initial and final states as, as zero and, and one, you get some correction that depends on how the the electrostatic potential for state one, the final state, how that interacts with the change in the fast polarization charge. So, so the basic phenomenological idea here, and, and by the way, I, I wrote this review about dielectric continuum methods in quantum chemistry earlier this year, and, and it talks in, in some detail about this phenomenology. The basic picture is, um, that we equilibrate the initial state of my solute using the static dielectric constant. So that's epsilon naught equals 78 for water um, because that value includes all of the relaxation mechanisms of the solvent, including you know, orientation, reorientation of the solvent molecules. Uh, but then we're gonna come in and we're gonna ionize that, that solute very quickly, it's essentially infinitely quickly on the time scale of, of the solvent. And, and, and we wanna calculate a, a, a vertical ionization energy. So the, the nuclei of, of this continuum solvent are frozen. And the only way that the solvent can respond to that fast perturbation is through its electronic degrees of freedom. And, and those are you know, codified in this infinite frequency, um, epsilon infinity equals 1.8 for, for water. And, and then before I show you some data, just to put everybody on the same page, let me talk about the difference between vertical and adiabatic ionization energies. Um, and so a, a vertical ionization energy is, is more or less exactly what it sounds like. So it's going from, from my initial state to the final state in a, in a vertical sense, in, in the sense that the nuclei are frozen. Um, this is actually sort of a fictitious construct quantum chemists construct, because in reality, your, your photoelectron spectrum consists of a, of a vibrational progression here, because you have to hit some um, quantum state, some vibrational state in the, in the final state of your, 
of your solute. Um, but in fact, in the applications that I'm going to show you, the, the structures that we get are taken from classical molecular dynamic simulations. And so those vibrations are, are described in terms of the classical MD sample. Right? And, and so um, you know, within that approximation, this, the idea of a vertical ionization energy makes, makes some sense. And then we'll need to, to ensemble average that vertical ionization energy over snapshots. And, and that ensemble averaging is, is the, the classical analog of, of describing this, this vibrational progression in the, in the final state. And then in contrast, an adiabatic uh, ionization energy is going from the zero level of the initial charge state to the zero level of the, of the final charge state, right? And, and so that adiabatic ionization energy, um, that's what we would access in a, in a slow ionization process where we've allowed the final state to, to reach its, its equilibrium geometry. And, and so only for adiabatic ionization energies, which is not primarily what I'm interested in, today, um, but only for adiabatic ionization energies is it appropriate to use epsilon naught for, um, for both states. Right? This, but for this vertical ionization energy, we need to use this, this non-equilibrium um, procedure. And, and, and so then to help you interpret the data that, that I'm going to show you on the next slide, let me show you a cartoon. I'm going to show you some, some results for um, monatomic ions just so that we can take sampling out of the picture because you know I, I can I can sample the heck out of something like fluoride or or, or sodium in in aqueous solution and and also I can I can draw a very simple picture of what the solvation um, environment looks like around a monatomic um, ion and and for a cation we expect that relative to the anion that there's actually very little difference between the vertical and the adiabatic ionization energy. And the idea is that when I ionize M plus, my final state is M two plus. And, and you know, the, the solvation environment may contract a little bit, but the, the water molecules are basically oriented in the same way in the final state as they are in the initial state. Um, whereas for, for X minus, I'm going to photo detach an electron and I'm going to wind up with the neutral radical X and, and the, the orientation of the waters around neutral X is going to be quite different than, than around the anion. And, and so that manifests as a significant geometric relaxation of, of the solvent. And so we expect that the, the vertical ionization energy is much larger than the adiabatic uh, ionization energy. And that, that's going to be important in interpreting these next set of data. So just to show you the role that this non-equilibrium continuum correction can play, uh, I'm actually going to show you first a set of calculations with, with PCM boundary conditions in bulk isotropic water. So we've actually implemented this non-equilibrium formalism uh, both for, for isotropic PCMs, but also for this anisotropic uh, Poisson equation solver. And, um, for a bunch of, of fairly simple solutes, except for hydrated electron, which is much more complicated, but is a longstanding interest of mine. Um, and, and these are calculations at the MP2 level and with about two solvation shells of explicit water molecules. And, and the first set of data here labeled no PCM includes those 30 explicit water molecules. And, and these numbers are also averaged over over MD sampling. So these are ensemble average numbers uh, containing the, the solute plus about 30 water molecules. And, and in the absence of PCM boundary conditions, you can see that the, the numbers are not very good um, compared, to, compared to experiment. And, and that's just telling you that these ionization energies converge very slowly with respect to explicit solvent. And, and two solvation shells is not nearly enough. There are errors of, of multiple electron volts uh, with respect to experiment. So what we can do about that uh, very simply is we can just slap uh, epsilon equals 78 boundary conditions around both the initial state and the final state. And, and I call that equilibrium continuum solvation. And it's appropriate 
for an adiabatic ionization energy, which is not what these experiments are measuring, but we can do the calculation um, we, just with two different choices of how we define the, the, the solute cavity, either just taking a single sphere around these two solvation shells or this solvent accessible surface. And, and um, the difference is, is small compared to the overall errors in, in either, it's just sort of a sanity check. Um, but if you look at these data and compare them to experiment, you'll find that, that actually the cations look pretty good. Um, that turns out to be a little bit of fortuitous error cancellation, but, but the cations look pretty good. Um, the anions don't. And uh, so the, there are still large errors in the anions. And, and I rationalize that in terms of the fact that for an anion, I expect the, the vertical ionization energy that's measured to be quite different from the adiabatic ionization energy in this equilibrium continuum solvation is really appropriate. So at best, we're measuring, we're, we're calculating adiabatic ionization energies here. And, and so we expect significant or should expect significant differences relative to experiment. And so then the last set of data are the non-equilibrium boundary conditions. And, and now for the for the anions, the, the results are, are basically quantitative. Maybe not for hydrogen electron, but, but that's a hard system for, for these very simple monatomic anions. It's basically quantitative. Um, these cations are, are, are not quite, and I think the errors here is, is actually residual um, electronic structure theory errors. Um, there's some correlation effects beyond the MP2 level. And I think these numbers were benefiting from some, some error cancellation there. But, but these, these anion results lead me to believe that this is really um, a very effective scheme for modeling uh, vertical ionization energies provided that we're willing to include about two solvation shells worth of explicit um, quantum mechanical water molecules. Okay, and so with that, um, that's the conclusion of the theoretical parts of the talk, or at least the methods part of the talk. And, and now I'll, I'll spend the, the last part of the time um, talking about an application, and, and that's to study uh, vertical ionization energies at the, at the air-water interface. So What's new in, in about the last 10 years um, is technology for, for measuring ionization energies, not just in the gas phase, but in, um, in liquid water. And actually, this, this liquid microjet technology goes back to the late 90s, but, but it's, um, it's become a lot cheaper recently. And so you're starting to see um, a lot of experiments of um, doing photoelectron spectroscopy in aqueous environments. And, and so that's very interesting to me. It means that we're you know, computing, potentially measuring things like, uh, you know, directly measuring the, the, the Marcus parameters that you would need for, for thinking about electron transfer, not in the gas phase, but, but in aqueous solution. Um, and so I want to think about the theory behind those, and, and I, I think someone needs to think about the theory behind those because relative to gas phase photoelectron spectroscopy, there are some complexities, and, and the complexity is that in liquid solution, you, you have to get the photoelectrons out, and, and those photoelectrons can scatter um, on, on their way out of solution, and they lose energy um, in, in scattering, and so the the electron kinetic energies that, that you measure um, can't be turned directly into ionization energies. There, there needs to be some consideration of, of, of how much energy was lost in the, in the scattering of the outgoing photoelectron. And so there's these concepts of a electron attenuation length where you just may not get all of the electrons out because um, they get attenuated exponentially um, the deeper you go into the liquid because there's some probability that the electrons just do chemistry on their way out um, and this other idea of an inelastic mean free path and, and both of these quantities are, are dependent on the the energy of the outgoing photoelectron and so they're dependent on the wavelength of the photo detachment laser and and that dependence can be measured and and for the photon energies that are typically used in experiments, the punchline is that the electron attenuation length is about one to two nanometers. And, and so it has been considered that 
liquid microjet photoelectron spectroscopy is an interface sensitive technique um, because you're, you're only perhaps probing the first one to two nanometers of the liquid solution because any deeper than that, you're not going to get the photoelectrons out. The photoelectrons are going to undergo some sort of chemistry uh, before they can escape the liquid and, and, and you don't see them. Um, on the other hand, from, from the point of view of someone that has done molecular dynamics simulations of, of a periodic slab of an air water interface, I can tell you that that um, you know the bulk water density converges on on a length scale of, of maybe a few angstroms, and, and so um, you know ten angstroms or a nanometer into the liquid really looks to me, from an atomistic simulation point of view, looks to me like bulk liquid. Okay, so um, so that's those are the experiments that we want to simulate. Uh, we're going to do this um, in our first attempt. We're going to study sort of the the general chemistry textbook list of inorganic ions, uh, because there were exper because those were the first experiments, and so there are good experimental data, sort of for the general chemistry textbook list of, of inorganic ions. Um, and and importantly, uh, some of those ions are are surface active, are, are known to to partition at the interface, um, and then others, in particular the polyvalent ones, are are not. Um, but in, and these are just data showing you that, that I can converge the vertical ionization energies with respect to the amount of, of QM um, uh, atomistic uh, explicit solvent molecules that are contained in, in this QM region. And I, I can converge it even, even for something like phosphate that's triply charged and, and, and phosphate um, converges much more slowly than, than do these other ions, but, but actually seven and a half angstroms for for phosphate is is still about two solvation shells. It's it's much more than thirty water molecules. It's more like I think seventy or eighty water molecules, but it's still actually about two solvation shells around this ion. So we know what it takes to to converge these calculations, and and we've we've run them in the in the converged limit. And then here's a, a, a plot of the vertical ionization energies that we calculate versus versus experimental values and the details here. Um, these are based on classical MD simulations of, of a periodic slab with the polarizable amoeba force field. Um, and then we run the simulations and, and in the simulation, we know where the ion sits relative at, at any given snapshot, we know where the where the ion sits relative to the air water interface. And so we can partition the data into a, a bulk part and an interfacial part. And, and so you see two sets of two sets of symbols here. And then actually we can simulate the the bulk part just with a with a cubic unit cell where there's no interface. And, and importantly, for any given ion, um, you know, you have trouble distinguishing the the bulk data point from the interfacial data point. And, and if I show you the numbers, and, and there's a few different ions highlighted in red, the ones that are highlighted in red um, are, are soft ions that, that are known to be surface active. So um, conventionally, so, so starting for, for those of you that may not know the history of, of say second harmonic generation experiments at the air water interface, um, starting in the late 1990s, there were SFG and SHG experiments of, of ions at the air water interface that suggested that soft, soft anions um, exhibit some sort of surface activity. And now what, what surface activity means is a little bit controversial. 20 years ago, it was interpreted that ions like iodide uh, partition preferentially at the air water interface whereas an image charge picture would predict that they're repelled from the interface. Um, these days, I think the, the more conventional understanding is, is that surface activity simply means that a soft anion like iodide or thiocyanate is, is simply not repelled from the interface in the way that, that a hard anion like these, these polyvalent things is, is repelled from, from the interface. And so um, these four ions that are shown in red have particular surface propensities, it's experimental ionization energies here, but, but then my computed values either in the bulk or slab simulations and, and, and 
basically you can't tell the difference, right? So, so the difference between the, the ionization energy at the air water interface and the ionization energy in, in bulk water is small compared to the overall accuracy of my calculations, which is about 0.2 EV with respect to experiments. And, and so that, that's our picture actually, is that, is that we don't think that photoelectron spectroscopy is sensitive to, um, to whether this ion sits at the, at the interface or, or in the bulk. And so just to look at, at two of the canonical surface active ions, iodide and, and thiocyanate, um, and show you the, the full distributions of, of, of vertical ionization energies um, partitioned into bulk data versus, versus, uh, versus ions at the interface. And, and, and basically you can't tell, right? If you sort of squinted it, it, it all, all looks the same. And it, and it looks the same regardless of how we partition the bulk data from the interfacial data based on um, distance from the Gibbs dividing surface. And, and so basically we think we can't tell and photoelectron spectroscopy can't tell the difference between a vertical ionization energy at the at the air water interface versus in bulk water so if you pause and think about that for a second it's a little puzzling because in the very beginning of my talk i did show you that that these ionization energies converge very slowly with respect to explicit water and, and what that means is that as I start from, from the bare ion and, and start to glom on water molecules, the hydrogen bonds that I'm forming change the ionization energy a lot. And, and, and so that ionization energy converges only very slowly. Um, and yet here I am telling you that I can't tell the difference between um, ionization energies at the air water interface versus bulk solution. And so what does that mean? Well, we can dig into these simulation data a little more deeply for either iodide or thiocyanate. And, and these are just some snapshots from the simulation where the, the ion maybe starts at the interface, but, but later on is, is found in, in bulk solution. And, and here's a plot of the distance from the Gibbs dividing surface. And so you can see these ions in this particular simulation. They sit at the interface for a while and then at about 600 picoseconds. Um, goes into bulk solution for a while. And if I waited, it would, it would come back. And if I look at those same data, but plot the number of hydrogen bonds on average around that ion or the vertical ionization energy, um, you, you almost can't tell that the ion moves into the bulk at, at about 600 picoseconds. You, you can maybe tell in these iodide data that, that it gains about eight tenths of a hydrogen bond, but, but it's, it's, the difference is, is, is pretty slight. And, and in fact, if we look at a whole bunch of different metrics for what does the solvation environment look like around this ion in terms of, of an average hydrogen bond angle or a distance, or, or just counting the number of hydrogen bonds, um, comparing bulk data to interfacial data, we see almost no difference. Um, you, you can see differences in the coordination numbers, but, but those are sort of trivial differences just based on the fact that the, the water density is, is much lower at the interface than it, than it is um, in the bulk. And then if I show you the numerical data here and just focus on the counting of the number of, of hydrogen bonds for something like nitrate, you see that, that on average, as we go from, from bulk nitrate ion to interfacial nitrate ion, we go from about five and a half hydrogen bonds to about four and a half hydrogen bonds. But for other surface active ions like perchlorate or thiocyanate, the number of hydrogen bonds is basically identical. And, and so the, the way that I um, sort of rectify this, this paradox that, that the ionization energies seem to be very similar at the, at the interface as to what they are in bulk water. And yet the ionization energy is very sensitive to hydrogen bonding, short range hydrogen bonding, is, is that actually what we've discovered here is that the short range hydrogen bonding is not that different at the air water interface than it, than it is in bulk water. And, and that's, I would say a little bit surprising, although there are a couple of antecedents to this idea in the, in the literature that are, that are cited here. Okay, so, so that's basically my story. Let me, let me just wrap up 
couple of conclusion slides. Um, so the punchline here is that we can we can efficiently converge uh, vertical ionization energies based on non-equilibrium continuum boundary conditions. And, and you know, if photoelectron spectroscopy is not your thing, um, you know, PKAs is, 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 is another example where you might want this kind of an approach. Um, in, in terms of the machinery, um, Right now, this 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 method. So you know, we we've, we've done these calculations with density functional theory for the for the QM region. In in principle, this is extensible to correlated wave functions, and we're working on that. Um, you know, that may not be of interest to biomolecular people, but um, but but as of right now, um, the the three dimensional discretization is is rate limiting. So so you will notice a slowdown relative to your standard density functional. Um, calculation, although the formal scaling is still cubic with system size, but but we sort of know how to how to fix this, and, and so we're working on a more efficient implementation of this algorithm. Uh, and then I just told you about uh, first shell hydrogen bonding that 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 uh, you know the the VIEs seem to be very similar at the air water interface as the, as they are at the bulk, um, and and so you know how how do we explain 20 years of surface sensitive vibrational spectroscopy done by including by people like my colleague Heather Allen that, that shows that that OH vibrational line shapes um, in surface sensitive vibrational spectroscopy do change significantly when you dissolve soft ions, you know, dissolve say sodium iodide in, in water and you see a, a significant change in the OH vibrational line shape with a surface sensitive spectroscopy, we think that, that that's actually not telling you directly about ion water hydrogen bonding. It's telling you about something much more subtle. And, and that is how are the, the water water hydrogen bonds in the second or maybe even third solvation shell of that ion, how are the water water hydrogen bonds affected by the, by the presence of the ion? Um, so there's, there's a lot more work, I think, that needs to be done to connect detailed simulations um, to these vibrational spectroscopy experiments. But I think that this is a, a provocative result. Um, all of this is implemented in the, in the QCAM software. And as Walter told you, and I'm sort of heavily involved in the development of that software. Um, and these are the people that have done the work in my, in my group starting three or four years ago, I, I just wrote this review and this Jack's paper has the, has the application that we just published and, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, John. Are there questions? In the meanwhile, I have one question myself. Uh, do you think or do you know whether anybody, if not yourself, uh, uh, has tried to use uh, um, integral uh, molecular uh, simulation like uh, 3D RISM or similar approaches and whether they could improve on the simple electrostatic, the electrostatics for uh, these kind of problems? Uh, so, just if, if we're talking about um, solvation models in quantum chemistry as a whole, the answer is, is definitely yes. It, it's, it's sort of a niche industry, but there are, there are QM implementations of 3D RISM. Um, uh, the names are escaping me for, for it, 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 it is sort of a niche. And so, so I, yeah. can't, I can't immediately think of the, but, uh, but in terms of, of has it been done specifically for the ions and interfaces problem, um, I think I think the answer is probably no. And, and actually, I think that is kind of antithetical to 3D RISM, right? Because mm. the whole idea is it's based on, on bulk G of Rs. Mm. Right, and and so you can do it in bulk solvent, where where the distribution of you know where you can get the G of R and the distribution of the solvent molecules from a simulation, but but that would have to be modified in some way at a, at an interface, and I don't think that anyone has has done that. But but there are a few implementations of of um, of three D RISM for. Um, I, I, I think they're mostly in, I, I don't think there's mainstream 
implementations in in quantum chemistry codes that you might you know be able to just pick up and run I, okay. I, could, could, I could be wrong about that but i think this is mostly a sort of experimental done it at individual research group levels like yeah so uh, uh, jay is suggesting maybe it's possible that in Co the kovalenko's group um somebody has tried to to work on this okay so i, I mean it, 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 i've definitely seen the papers so so people have done it um i i but but i i suspect it's their own interface they have their own local 3d rhythm code that yeah they yeah pro probably interfaced with gaussian or, or with something else I, i don't know that it's available in you know just the commercial version that yeah, you could yeah, yeah. Buy or, or download um, but I, i could be wrong i see okay uh any more questions okay in uh, i have a question yeah okay folks can see me um i'm curious this is a fabulous talk thank you um is is there a relationship between the non-equilibrium uh continuum model that you're using and the song chandler dielectric relaxation model i this go, it goes way back and this isn't my area so i apologize if it's an english uh, question it's, it's, it's also I, i think you've just gone well beyond my statistical mechanics training um so i i'm unfamiliar with this model um, okay so if you could describe it in two sentences i could maybe give you a half assed hey. answer but <laughs> fair enough i'm not it's been a very long time since i i looked at it uh to be honest my my recollection was merely that they were looking at um, sort of a salvation dynamics um, from the perspective of some kind of uh, vertical excitation energy. And I remember them using the optical dielectric constant. So, so I mean, the, 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 the answer is prob probably, it, it, it's probably conceptually very similar because so, okay. I mean, I, I should also, you know, by way of, Full disclosure, I guess I, I didn't give you all the references, but we, we were certainly not the first people to, to do non-equilibrium continuum theory. I mean, sure. arguably Marcus was the first person to do non-equilibrium right. continuum theory in the 50s. But but even within the, the context of, of PCM specifically, um, Jacopo Tomasi's group did it in the 90s, if not earlier, um, and, 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 and other people in the PCM community have done it. We, we have our own particular flavor of this, the details of which are not important for this talk, but, but all of these things are, are based, are, are, so, so I, it's, it's, it's almost certain that, that the answer to your question is, yeah, it's at a phenomenological level, it's the same, because the whole idea is you take, you take epsilon of omega, and you model it in terms of its high and its low frequency limits, right? And those are the static and the optical dielectric constant. And you just partition the polarization response into, into fast and slow. And, and, and there's been, if you want to do that in a little more detail, which uh, you know, there's been some work on, on you can introduce a, a Debye type model Um, so, so then, you know, a, a Debye yeah, type right. model goes, goes one step beyond that by introducing one time scale, right? So you, uh, one, one frequency, and then you could, you know, introduce a few frequencies. I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced that the accuracy of continuum solvation in general warrants that approach. So this, this epsilon not epsilon infinity to me seems like the sweet spot of, um, uh, you know, Of, of kind of a crude coarse graining, but but you know the whole model is kind of a crude coarse graining, and 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 you you, know, you want to make sure that you're not um, working too hard on something that you know has intrinsic error bars of you know whatever. But yeah, but, thank but, you. So it's, it's cool. probably all, all all these things are, are are based on that basic phenomenology. So the answer to your question is probably that at a phenomenological level, it's the same. Even 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 though I'm not familiar with this Chandler theory. <laughs> Fair enough. Thank you. Okay. Are there any more questions? Oh, if not, then let me thank uh, again uh, the second speaker of today, uh, John. Thank you very much. And yeah, thank, thanks again for the introduction. And we'll. Uh, or, the, or the invitation. Yeah.
Uh, also the introduction. <laughs> uh, thank you. Glad that you accepted. Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll meet uh, next week uh, with the um, speakers, uh, which will be Francisca Nestler and uh, uh, Ivo Cabasho. Uh, 